I even gave him the signal to come on in. Uh, while folks are settling in, I want to give you a few announcements, some things that are coming up uh, in the next few days, starting with what's coming up this afternoon. Uh, I want to encourage everybody to set aside some time this afternoon slash evening to come to our district hymn sing. That's what we call it. Basically, it's a, the fellowship of the Churches of the Brethren in the District of Idaho. There's Fruitland, there's Beaumont, there's Twin Falls, there's, there's uh, Boise Valley, there's Mountain View, there's us. We're going to gather here in our fellowship hall. We're going to sing the hymns that you're like, man, why haven't we sung that one recently? So you get a chance to sing that. So we're going to have you come. We'll uh, share in some singing. We'll share in some uh, stories of what's going on in the churches around the district. We'll share in a fellowship meal. And so you don't have to plan for dinner. And so you are all invited to come to that. I want to encourage us to participate in this because uh, we want to lift one another up in the district and uh, encourage that, that sort of uh, mutual sharing. Uh, so do come this afternoon. 4.30 is when we'll start the program. Goes about an hour and then we'll have a meal after that. So we want to invite you to come to that. Following that, I'm going to be out of town for a week. Um, I'm going back to annual conference. So we're having our Church of the Brethren's annual meeting um, on uh, this coming week, which uh, I'll fly out on Tuesday. I'll be back Sunday afternoon back here in the valley. Um, so do be praying for annual conference. Uh, it always needs to be covered in prayer so that folks will follow the spirit uh, of God and not their own inclinations. You know people. <laughs> This is who we are as human beings, is we have a tendency to want to kind of put our own desires and things in front of what God wants. So we want to pray for God's guidance in that. The next, so I'll get back on next Sunday, that's the 7th, um, that will be Camp Sunday. I will be in the air while you are here worshiping. This service will be held outside in the gazebo. So the piano's already there, ready to, to be rolled out. So there'll be camp songs, there'll be testimonies, there'll be some special presentations by people that uh, you will be like, oh, I want to hear them preach. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. <laughs> so uh, encourage them uh, on, on Sunday. That they're going to share some things. Uh, so that is uh, coming up on the 7th. So there will be no early service if you're a regular early service attender. The Sunday school, the adult Sunday school class, we're just going to have fellowship time during that time because I didn't get through my lesson today, so I got to pick it up next time and get all those details. And then uh, the service will be outside in the gazebo at 11 o'clock. That's the seventh that leads us into camp week, which is the following week. And we do want to make sure that if you are ready or not going to sign up for that, make sure that you get, uh, if you have questions, talk to Byron. He's more than willing to answer those questions. And it, regardless, cover that whole week in prayer because it's an opportunity for young people to learn about Jesus, and that is awesome. I want to have just, I want to be praying for everybody that's involved with it that they would uh, sense the presence of the Spirit and be drawn closer to God as they're drawn close to each other. So, Byron's the man to talk to about camp. That's the following week. I don't even know what's happening after that. So, we'll find out when we get there together. I'm going to get out of the way. Sue, would you begin our service? Good morning. How good it is to be together. I'd like to welcome each of you. Um, it looks a little sparse this morning, but that's okay because you know what the Lord said about where two or more are gathered in his name. He is here. Uh, good to see some uh, Familiar faces from a long time ago. Hi, Dana. <laughs> Welcome back, those who have been traveling. And just we just pray that each of you will be blessed by our time together this morning. So amazingly, it is the last day of June, which means that the 4th of July is quickly approaching our Independence Day. And it seems appropriate to acknowledge the incredible gift we have in the freedom to gather and worship. We are indeed blessed. We're blessed with this building, this body of believers, 
this time to be in the presence of a gracious God. Sadly, though, I've had some conversations recently with some folks who don't seem to fully share the understanding, the full understanding of that gift. Not necessarily because they don't appreciate the freedom, but because their experience with the church hasn't been perfect. It reminded me of some advice I had read recently that said, stop looking for the perfect church. Go worship a perfect God today with a congregation of flawed people who need grace as much as you do. Another incredible gift, that grace. So, my flawed sisters and brothers, Let's come together with gratitude for the freedoms we enjoy and the grace offered by our perfect God as we prepare our hearts to worship him. Let's go to him in prayer. Oh, perfect God, thank you for meeting us here today. Help us never to take for granted the freedom we have to gather in your name in your house to sing and pray and praise and hear your word. We are so grateful for the grace you have so freely given us, your imperfect children. Guide us as we worship, O oh Lord, and open our hearts and minds to your word and your perfect will. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 17 through 21. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and miracles, through the power of the Spirit. So from Jerusalem all the way to Elycrium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who were not told about him will see, and those who have not heard about him will understand. If you would all stand with me as we start with, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. Majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Oh Lord, we praise your name. Oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of Peace, mighty God. Oh Lord, our Sing. 
Along with the freedom to worship, we also have the freedom to give or not to give. Giving is not just about fulfilling our duty as Christians, but it's a reflection of our love for God and a desire to do his work. Of course, our gifts may not just be limited to what we put in these offering plates or sent electronically via our banks. They can be in the form of love shown to others, a hug, a kind word, a meal, an impromptu visit, service to our church or our community. My family and I have been the recipients of many of these gifts in the past few weeks, and we have been so grateful for and so incredibly blessed by them. Matthew 6:21 reminds us, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's offer our treasure with gratitude and willing hearts. Shall we bow in prayer? O oh, most gracious, generous God, we bring these gifts to your altar and ask your blessing on them, as well as your blessing on those who have freely given. May our gifts always be a reflection of our love for you, and may they be used for your service to honor and glorify you. In the name of our greatest gift, our Savior, 
Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Sue. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. They're all in one row. She gonna hang out? No, it's all right. Hi, Beckett. Oh, so a couple of weeks ago it was Father's Day. You guys remember that? Did you guys did you guys make pancakes for your fathers? Oh, you were in Mexico. Wow, I want to hear about that sometime. Was it good? Nice, good. Well. We had to do something uh, in the illustration on that day that had to do with VBS, because that was coming up. So we talked about rocks that day. And then the next Sunday, we did this experiment with science that was so awesome that Brittany showed us during VBS that I had to share that. But I need to go back to talking to you about what God is like. Do you remember we've been talking about that? That's what we have right here, here. So we talked about God being like the wind that you can't see, but... When the wind blows, beautiful things can happen. You can hear it in the sound of these chimes or in your own life. We also talked about being attached to the true vine, which is like God. Now, remember what this is? What is that? A grapevine. Does it look healthy? It looks bad, doesn't it? Because it is not attached. So we need to be attached to God so that we can be healthy and we can thrive. Because this is kind of what happens to our spirit when we're not. Kind of bad, huh? But you guys are in good shape, so don't worry. I just wanted to use this as an illustration. Now, what about this? This big rock. God is like a rock. And we talked about Ayers Rock in Australia that has all kinds of interesting springs and places of shelter around it. And the Bible talks about God being like a rock that you can go to to find shelter. So God is solid and secure, and we sang that song just a second ago, that on Christ the solid rock I stand, and all other ground is sinking sand. That's what we're talking about. That comes from the Bible. Today, I want to talk about God as a father. Have you guys heard that before? Sometimes we talk about God as a father. Now, did you know that I'm a father? Did you? Well, who's my son? Where's he at? Right there. Yeah, I told him I was going to kind of put him on the spot today. But I'm not going to make him come over because, yeah. Anyway, so as a father, I want good things for my son. I want him to do the right thing. And he does the right thing most of the time. And if you wanted to talk to my father, he would say the same thing. That he wanted me and still wants me to do the right thing. And sometimes I don't. But that's what he wants from me. Fathers, when they do their best, want the best for their kids. They want their kids to be safe and secure and to grow and mature, and they want to take care of you. Now, I know that I don't always do the best job as a father. Sometimes I kind of make mistakes, and sometimes I yell, and sometimes I'm not as kind as I could be. Not very often. Well, maybe more than I should. Because I'm a human being. But God, as the perfect heavenly father, doesn't make any mistakes with us. He's always loving and always kind and always wants the best and always makes sure that we have what we need and always disciplines us when we need it. You guys get disciplined sometimes? Oh, yeah, I know it. But it's good for us because we grow into what we should be as a result. So God is like a father to us in the best possible way. That's another way to think about God. Go. You're right. That's absolutely right. Do you think your father's love... I know I love Cyrus the same, even if he makes mistakes. I'm pretty sure that my dad loves me the same, even when I make mistakes. And God does that perfectly. So thank you for bringing that up. So that's another way to think about God. We think about God like the wind. We think about God like the vine that we're attached to if we want to be healthy. We think about God like a a rock that is solid and secure in our life when everything else is weird and tossed up. And we can think about God like a father who takes care of us and wants the best for us and will help us achieve that, even if we make mistakes. God still loves us. We getting a picture from God here now? It's a pretty big picture. We've got more. We'll talk about more next time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being like the wind that does beautiful things in our lives. 
Thank you for being like a vine that gives us health and strength and helps us to produce fruit. Thank you for being like a rock that is solid and secure when everything around us is like shifting sand. And thank you for being like a perfect father to us who always wants the best and takes care of us and loves us no matter what. We just thank you for being you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go. If you would all stand with me as we sing Amazing Grace. Cyrus was a little nervous there about what I was going to do. I told him I was going to use him as an example in the kid's story, and uh, I didn't tell him what I was going to do. How many parents have done that to their kids before? No, I'm not going to tell you what we're doing. Thank you. Today I want to read from Acts. Again, we are in this story of the Holy Spirit moving and acting as the, the gospel goes forth from the beginning in Jerusalem all the way to the ends of the earth. And so we've been following this along. I do want to share a little bit before we begin, though. This is, we're taking a break 
from Acts for a moment. There's something that's been on my heart that I want to share with you. So after I get back from annual conference on the 14th, we're going to start talking about the way that we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so we won't be following uh, an exposition of the text like we do here. We're going to kind of go topic to topic. There'll be plenty of scripture involved, so don't worry about that. But we do want to talk about this for a period of time just because, you know, it's good to have these principles of transformation of becoming Christ-like in our minds as we move through the world. Then we'll pick up again and finish this wonderful story in Acts, uh, all the way to the very end of of what uh, Luke has been trying to tell us. But for right now, remember where we are. Paul is still in Roman custody. He has been to Jerusalem. There's been a problem there. There are people that are out to get him. And now he's in Roman custody. And he's been there for quite a while. We'll talk about that in a moment. But today we're going to move from this Governor Felix, who was holding Paul in Caesarea to Festus. He's the next of our figures in the Roman world. Beginning in the first verse of the 25th chapter of Acts, Luke writes this. Three days after Festus had arrived in the province, he went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews gave him a report against Paul. They appealed to him and requested, as a favor to them against Paul, to have him transferred to Jerusalem. They were, in fact, planning an ambush to kill him along the way. And Festus replied that Paul was being kept in Caesarea and that he himself intended to go there shortly. So, he said, let those of you who have the authority to come, authority come down with me and if there is anything wrong about the man, let them accuse him. So again, Just a section out of a much bigger story. I don't really want to lose Paul here in the shuffle. We want to pay attention to this primary figure in Luke's story. But the story does, at this point in in Luke's account, it gets a little complicated. And there's a lot going on. Now, normally when there's a lot going on in the story, we try to filter out some of those extraneous details with the stuff that's going on in the background. Stuff with guys like Felix or, or Festus. We do that most of the time. After all, there is always too much to keep track of at any given time. But today I want to invite you to to pay attention to something here, something that requires us to to get a little bit of a wider picture, uh, to to view a little bit of the context. So at at the risk of setting aside our main character, Paul, here for just a moment, Let's zoom out and and bring this whole imperial Roman Empire story into focus. Last week we talked at length about this character Felix, the Roman governor, and today we're looking at his successor, the guy who comes after him, Festus. Now both Felix and Festus were links in a long chain of Roman governors who were ruling in Judea. And each of these consecutive governors, they found Judea and the Jews to be problematic. These are not the easiest people to control and to rule over. The Jews were nothing if not troublesome. Now, part of this has to do with the way that there was a special relationship between Rome and and the Jews. The Romans, from the very earliest days of their empire, actually back into the Republic period of time, they were concerned with legitimacy. This is something that empires struggle with all the time, being legitimate. Yes, I have the right to rule. Now, one of the ways that the Romans legitimized their system was to appeal to antiquity, things that were old. If it was old, then they respected it. This shows up in the way that the Romans often copied wholesale patterns of Greek behavior, things that the Greeks did. They took the whole pantheon of Greek gods and they just adopted them wholesale. Their gods are our gods, but let's change the names. Zeus now becomes Jupiter and uh, Poseidon becomes Neptune and Ares becomes Mars, but they're the same. Now, linking themselves to antiquity, it gave the Romans a sense of continuity with the past. We're just naturally following along in this progression. We're the right ones to be on the throne. And the one thing that the Jews were is old. 
They'd been around and their faith had been around for a long time. They'd managed to hold on to that very singular worship of Yahweh for centuries. All through the reign of the, of the Assyrians, all through the reign of the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks after them. And it looked like it might continue on through the Roman Empire as well. So since these cultural and these uh, religious practices of the Jews were so antiquated and so old and they had that, that sense about them, the Romans, well, they had a certain measure of respect for that and they allowed the Jews the freedom to exercise their, their religion to resist a, a full assimilation into the empire. But as you can imagine, freedom, it has its own problems that come along with it. The Jews, as a result of their freedom, were notoriously difficult to control. There were countless uprisings and rebellions and factions, and it all created this really difficult situation for whatever Roman governor happened to be in power in Judea. Now, some of them, like Felix, for example, they chose, well, I'm just going to forget about governing. I'm not going to bother with that. It's too much work. Too much, it's hard, too hard to control these. I'm just going to do what's in my own best interest, pad my own coffers, get my own, my own out of it. Others, like Festus, for example, they tried to do the right thing. But Festus was put into this place, into this situation at a particular time of very significant unrest. Things were not stable in Judea when Festus arrived. First of all, there was all the trouble that his predecessor had stirred up. Felix was a terrible governor, and he made a big mess. He gets recalled to Rome because of that mess. If you remember from last week, we looked a little bit at the history. He actually stirred up a, 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 a fight between the Samaritans and the Jews just so that he could get rid of his competitor that was overseeing the Samaritans and take the whole region for himself. He was implicated in the assassination of the high priest Jonathan. This is the kind of person that Felix is. He's just kind of, a, kind of a mess, really, when it comes down to it. And one thing that particular that Felix did not do was address this rising tide of robbers and bandits and assassins that were starting to permeate the world in that region. Because of the freedom that they had, the relative freedom in the empire, the Jews they really did a good job of following their own hearts and their own counsel when it came to sorting out how they were going to relate to the Romans. Some of them were complicit. Oh, let's just go along with them. This is what the Sadducees said. Others were openly hostile towards the Romans. This was the position of the zealots. And among them all, during the festivals and in the streets, and in the marketplace, and out in the countryside, walking around, secretive and unchallenged, were the Sicarii, the daggermen, the assassins, violent insurrectionists who would just as soon stab a compromise. They had these short knives or swords that they would carry around in, their, in the folds of their cloaks, and they would sneak up beside you in the marketplace. And if you were a bad guy, in their minds, <clears throat> stick you in the ribs, and then they'd wander off and disappear. They were all over the place, these folks. And so this was something that Felix did not take care of. These violent bandits and terrorists, they were getting out of hand. And so the first job of Festus was to try to bring all of that under control. That is actually once he dealt with this very singular prisoner <laughs> that his predecessor had left languishing in prison for two years without any kind of charge is brought against him. Paul. Paul had, had, had appealed to his Roman citizenship as a way to get out of Jerusalem and, and get out of this plot that was, that was afoot to kill him there. He was still stuck in jail in Caesarea. Now, we're not talking about jail like we would understand it today. This is not solitary confinement or anything like that. Paul did have a certain measure of freedom to move around and maneuver, uh, he was allowed to uh, just do what he needed to do under guard. And his supporters, people that were, were sympathetic to him, could take care of him and supply for his needs. This is standard practice. This is the way things would have been for more upscale prisoners in the time. For the Romans, they didn't put people in prison as a punishment for crimes that they'd committed. They held them in prison until a trial could be uh, conducted. And, and then usually if the trial is conducted and you were convicted, you were executed. 
And if you were not convicted, you were set free. That's pretty much the only options. They didn't have any, a system of incarceration like we do today. So Paul is not free. He's waiting for his case to be heard. He's trying to keep out of the clutches of this, this Jewish faction that wants him dead. And since Felix didn't really want to alienate these Jews, he had held on to Paul. He kept kind of punting this trial down, down the way. He's waiting for Paul maybe to offer him a bribe. You know, every time they get together, he'd go, come on, Paul, you know, you've got some friends. Why don't you pay up and I'll let you go. This is Felix that we're talking about here. He invited Paul in, tell me about this way of Jesus. And, and as soon as the possibility of the bribe evaporates, because he figures that out pretty quickly, more significantly, as soon as Paul's gospel message starts to cut a little close to the bone for Felix, he's like, okay, we'll just lock you up get you out of my sight. I don't really want to talk to you. I don't really want to do with you. This is somebody else's problem. So this is the set of circumstances that, that Festus inherits. Bandits and assassins who are running around in the wilderness and in the streets. Arguments between all these different Jewish factions, none of whom really like the Romans. A powder keg. It's ready to blow up. I'm not really overstating that. This is only a few years before the Jewish-Roman War that ends up destroying the temple in 70 AD. This is where they're headed. It is unstable. And against this backdrop of, of intense civil unrest, here's Paul, this prisoner. Literally, three days after he shows up in the region, Festus comes to Jerusalem and the Jews are already presenting their case to him against Paul. You need to get this guy down here to Jerusalem, they're telling him, because they have plans <laughs> along the way. They're going to do away with him along the way. This assassination attempt is still out there. But Festus, he's a good governor. He knows what he's doing and so he doesn't take things at face value. You know what? I hear you. I've already got him locked up in, up in Caesarea. He's fine there. And if you have something to accuse him of, come with me as I go back, and then we'll hear the case there. Then about a week and a half later, he's back on his home ground. Festus hears the case, the accusations against Paul. Now, we've been following the story, and we know there is no case against Paul. There's no accusation that really can stick. There's no reason for him to be imprisoned. In his previous defenses, Paul has been very clear, explicitly so, that he's really just been trying to be a faithful Jew, doing all the things that he's supposed to do. There's no evidence against him. He knows that these Jews, they're just out to kill him in whatever way that they can, and he knows that he's the safest in Roman custody. So he's willing to just stay put. Every time they try to turn him out and say, okay, go back to Jerusalem, he's like, whoa, 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 I'm a Roman citizen. And this needs to be tried in a Roman court. And I haven't had my trial yet. And I appeal to Caesar. And Festus goes, all right, you, you said it. You have appealed to the emperor. To the emperor, you will go. So again, Luke is telling us a story of Paul here. It's a great story. And characters like Felix and Festus, they're kind of just in the background. They're foils, uh, conversation partners, the, the antagonist to Paul's protagonist. They're not that important to Luke. He doesn't really delve into their character and who they are. They don't really serve the purpose that Luke is trying to, trying to bring about here. But when you step back and do take a look at this bigger picture, this historical picture, you can see that Paul is entering into what is really the biggest stage of the age. There is no bigger forum in which he, he can enter into. He's literally one step away, one bureaucratic step away from Rome, the center of the known universe, the capital of the empire that, that encompasses the entire Mediterranean basin. Goes all the way to Britain. <laughs> it's all the way down into Africa. It's everywhere. And Rome is the center, and he's one step away from it. He is one step away from Nero, the Caesar, the most powerful figure on earth at the time. 
So Luke has framed this all really as the gospel, the good news that travels from its origins there in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem all the way out to the ends of the earth. And this is, again, Rome. He's framed it as the, as the, as the, the focus of this movement of the Spirit, and by extension, Paul, as he, as, he, as he accompanies the Spirit on this. And all of that focus keeps us from getting caught up in the bigger story or the background story, the glitz and the glory of the powers of the age. We don't get caught there. I think that's an important lesson. Luke is focusing our attention on what's truly important in the, in the story because humans, by nature, are distractible creatures. We just, we just turn our attention away from things. It's easily caught by whatever shiny thing we find in front of us. But we've got to be careful, though, that we're not also caught up in this stuff that we need to reject in favor of what is of surpassing, surpassing worth. The story that Luke is telling us, it's a story of power and how the good news confronts power, how the good news challenges power, the principalities and the powers of this world. And because we're reading this story and hearing this story, we have to decide, just like Paul, which power we're going to side with. So let's take a look at this story in terms of power. Who has the power? Why do they have the power? First, we've got to look at the Romans, the Roman governors in this case. Festus, Felix before him, they had an enormous amount of power in this context. We talked about it when they first took Paul into custody, that a, that a Roman soldier could beat anybody they wanted within an inch of their life. No cause, no trial, no, no reason, just because they didn't like their face. The only thing that saved Paul in that instance was the fact that he was a Roman citizen. That's how much power these folks have in their hands that, very, that just soldiers can, can go after whoever they want in the street. And they had this power because they represented the most powerful entity of the time, the Roman emperor. And this is political power that we're talking about. This is military power. This is the, the civic exercise of power through force. Rome kept the peace. They even had a label for it. They called it the Pax Romana the Roman peace. They kept this peace through the sometimes heavy-handed application of the most formidable military of its day. How did Rome conquer the known world? With lots and lots and lots of swords and lots and lots and lots of blood. That's how they did it. So Festus sits in this judgment seat because he represents the power of violence and force. Right or wrong, Festus is going to get his way, one way or the other. But Festus also has to contend with this other power, another power, the power that is represented in the traditions and the ancient religious practices that are controlled by the Jewish elite. This is another power. The Jews that are aligned against Paul, they have this power, the power of populism, because it's popular to follow what they are what they're proclaiming, what they, through which they control this very volatile yet very powerful force, the, Jew, the people of Judea. Now granted, when you look at that kind of power, it's not centralized, it's not all in one basket. There's all these factions and divisions and different groups that are running around. The, the, the ruling Sadducees, the, the pious Pharisees, the political zealots out there in the desert, there's those holier-than-thou Essenes who think they're better than everybody else. That wild card of the Sicarii assassins, who knows where they're going to come up, the bandits and the brigands. But all of this, and it made some unified voice impossible, all of it, there is the power of resentment and disaffection in the bitterness of the oppressed. There is great power. You push them far enough. And it's exactly what happens a few years down the road. So Paul is right in the middle here, caught between these two powers. Superficially, his greatest threat at the very moment is this plot to murder him, the one that's hatched by the Jews. His life is in danger. And so it looks like this appeal that he makes to the emperor, that's possibly the expedient way to align with the powers that promise him a slightly longer life. Okay, if I go in with the Jews, I'm in trouble. If I stick with the Romans, I'll probably live a little bit longer. 
He is safer for the moment in Roman custody than he would be if he were taking his chances with the Jews. But if we were to read the story that way, that's a very superficial reading of the story. It recognizes some of the power, the power of the Romans, the power of the Jews, and it recognizes that Paul can appeal to one of these powers or the other, and that is immediate safety. It depends on the correct appeal, going the right direction, but that's a reading of the story that has a very fatal blind spot because it misses the greatest power of all. You see, human culture is woven together with power. It's what binds all of these systems and all of these practices together. Who has power? Who exercises that power? Those with more power have the ability, the capacity to exercise that power to shape what we do, to shape our culture in a manner usually that benefits them. Think of it, think of it like a childhood game on a playground. Okay, you can think back, you remember this kind of stuff. If the kids are making up the game, if they're making up the rules and they're kind of setting up the game, it's those who possess the important toys, the important equipment, those are the ones that seem to set the rules for the game, don't they? Otherwise, there's always this possibility that they'll just take their toys and go home and the game's over. When it comes to playground games, we hope that there's an adult there close by who can step in and keep things fair to appeal to a higher sense of justice. But what happens when the kids are the adults? And there doesn't seem to be a higher authority to keep things fair. This is what leads to empire. This is the path to empire. There's no one to stop or check the aspirations of the emperor. The 19th century British moralist, Lord Acton, he said it well, and you've probably heard this. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And many of us aren't familiar with the, the second sentence here, which is, great men are almost always bad men. It's just a quote. <laughs> That's what he said. And keep in mind who's in charge of the world at the time that Paul is standing trial in front of Festus. It is the emperor Nero. Fiddled while Rome burned Nero. Nero, a madman who would allegedly take Christians and coat them in pitch and tar and tie them to stakes and light them on fire to illuminate his garden at night. That's the most powerful man in the world while Paul is on trial. So if Lord Acton was right, and there doesn't seem to be any indication that he's not right, the only thing that keeps all of the Neros of the world in check are limitations on their power. You give them enough power, this is what you end up with. But oh, power is intoxicating. Oh, we want it. In whatever little way we want it, we want it. The ability to control events. The ability to say, oh, you know what? I'm going to do this instead of that. I'm going to go right instead of left. That's power. Minimal in the case, but still power. And who doesn't want to affect uh, the circumstances that impact us? Who doesn't want to have a certain amount of control over that? Power gets us where we want to go. Power lets us do what we want to do. That connects power to this other very precious possession of ours, freedom. Power keeps us free. The more power we have, the more free we are. According to the accounting of the world, free to do whatever we want to do, when we want to do it. We do it because there's no one that can stop us. See how easily even something like freedom can be corrupted by power? I want to be clear. Power itself is not good or evil. Power is. It's amoral. There's no ethical component to it. The morality of power enters in when we start to figure out how to exercise power, what to do with power. Take a look at these two governors, Felix and Festus. 
Two figures that essentially have identical power, identical authority in their context. One of them exercises power for their own personal gain, always looking for the kickback, the bribe, to pad the palm. The other tries to leverage power for the good of those that he's governing. By all accounts, Festus was a good governor. Too bad we only had him for two years. He died while he was in office. But this is what we see over and over again throughout human history. Power is held and used for either good ends or evil purposes. And the more power that someone has, the more impact for good or evil that they have. And the prophet Jeremiah tells us, oh, this is a rough one. The heart of man is deceitful above all else. And because of that, without adults in the room, so to speak, the childishness of humanity rules the day. History and the morning news, <laughs> it tells us the same story. Power tends to corrupt because the hearts of men are corrupt. So here's what I think is going on. And I'm going to use the phrase principalities and powers because that's a good biblical sounding phrase. It's in, the, it's in the Bible. I'm going to use the phrase principalities and powers to describe those spiritual forces that influence us towards evil. The prophet is right. The prophet is right. There is enough deceit and perversion in the human heart to do all the damage that we could possibly imagine. But it would be foolish for us to deny that there are forces beyond our understanding that can move us towards evil. But it doesn't really matter whether the, the, the principalities and powers reside in the human heart or out there in the spiritual realm. The result is the same. It's what we see every day, a broken and fallen world in which violence and oppression rule the day. The empire of Rome, represented by Festus, ruled by Nero. That was the most powerful entity in the known world for Paul. There was nothing bigger than the Roman Empire. And so the temptation might have been for Paul to say, maybe I need to hitch my wagon to that. Maybe I need to get involved with that. Maybe I need to go over there and, 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 and bind myself to this very incredibly powerful entity. Not only because it protects my life, which it does as a Roman citizen, but possibly because if I'm still alive, I can keep proclaiming the gospel. I can leverage that power of the empire so that the Christian message keeps going out. I can get the government to protect the good news. Sounds dangerously familiar at times. The alternative for Paul, caught between these two worldly powers, seems to have been, well, if I can't do that, maybe I should align myself with this, this populist power of the Jewish elite. Yeah, I'm going to have to compromise the message a lot because these are the people that actually killed Jesus, after all. So if I'm going to be talking about Jesus, I may have to downplay some of that stuff. But... Maybe it would be easier for me. Maybe it would be more productive if I didn't rock the boat so much. Wouldn't it have been good for the gospel if Paul didn't have to swim upstream all the time against the resentment of the religious establishment? If he just went along? That's Paul. And sometimes that's a perspective that we are tempted to take. That our work in Christ, our presentation of the gospel in whatever form the Spirit leads us to present it, that somehow we need to prop it up and protect it and buttress it by the principalities and the powers of this world. We're tempted to ally ourselves with the, with the, the power of the world to gather to ourselves more power to, to make the good news irresistible to people simply because no one has the power to resist it. We force it upon them. How unlike Paul. Paul was not that way. You read his letters and you see this. Paul is not afraid of what would seem to be a powerless gospel. A gospel that is foolishness to the Gentiles. That is a stumbling block to the Jews. Paul is not afraid of this seemingly powerless gospel that proclaims a crucified Messiah. <laughs> because Paul understood something. He understood that what this gospel lacked in human power, it more than made up for in the power of God. 
This is the profound theme of this whole part of Acts. Luke is telling us the story of Paul and Paul's consistent message of God's saving grace. Not Paul's saving grace. Not the church's saving grace. God's saving grace. This isn't the salvation of the Jewish temple practices and their religious traditions. It's not the salvation of a violently powerful Roman Empire. No, Paul is preaching a gospel that puts God right in the center, right in the middle. I don't know if you caught it today with the songs that we sung. We sung some incredible songs that put God right at the center. There's some profound theology in those songs. I hope you caught it. Thank you. But this is what Paul is preaching. And there is no more powerful center than God. Because Paul is consistently focused on Jesus. He's able to maneuver through all of these halls of power without fear. He doesn't care if he dies or he lives. He's just going to be consistent in his message. He confronts those principalities and those powers, all these things that tried to distract him from that beautiful truth of God's love. He knew exactly where power was found, true power. Yay, Paul, right? Good on you, Paul. What about us? Where do we stand? When we're confronted with the same kind of thing that Paul gets confronted with, the challenge, our own Festus, our own uh, uh, Roman imperial force, what do we do? When we're confronted by all the plots and the machinations and the, the threats and the schemes to do away with what it is God's trying to accomplish in our lives, what do we do? Do we simply say, eh, that's the way it is. That's just the way the world works. Do we plug our nose and swallow the bile and tell ourselves, well, we've got no choice than just to get on board with whatever principality or power happens to be in front of us? could do that or we could insist consistently like Paul that we serve a higher power a greater God Paul could have easily said you know what this is too much work I'm just going to kind of get on board with what people expect out of me he could have streamlined his path to freedom could have said what he needed to say to get out and maybe if he'd gotten out he might have been able to convert a few more people, been able to, to preach and start a few more churches if he'd be willing to compromise. After all, I mean, Festus was kind of on his side. I mean, he's like, yeah, I kind of want to let you go, Paul. I think you've been held here too long. I don't think there's any charge against you. But Paul isn't interested in getting the Romans on his side. He's not interested in the support of the Roman establishment, any more than he was trying to find the stamp of approval from the Jewish elite. Whatever his personal fate was, and we know what it was. I mean, he ends up going to his death here. But whatever his personal fate was, he was ready to serve God alone. And maybe that's our calling too. Maybe that's what's in front of us as well. To reject all the principalities and the powers and the temptations in whatever form that they take so that we can be totally, 100% devoted to Jesus. Well, actually, there's no maybe about that. It is our calling. It is absolutely our calling. And it's a challenge. Our challenge. We've got to be able to be discerning and identify those principalities and powers that tempt us away from a full-hearted devotion to God. And we need to reject those things, even, even though they are tempting, even though there is a sense that says, yeah, maybe I should get on board with that. We need to reject all forms of worldly power that compromise and corrupt our wholehearted devotion to Jesus. 100% for Jesus. I say 100% because there is no such thing as 110%. 100% is the top. You can't get more than that. 100% for Jesus. Because in the end, 
all of the powers and all of the principalities, all of that passes away. I mean, are the Romans around still? Are the Persians and the Babylonians, the Assyrians, are those empires still with us? No, they pass away. The only thing that lasts is the surpassingly powerful love of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we know that there are a lot of temptations in this world. There's a lot of forces that are beckoning to us, calling us, saying, just get on board, follow along, do what we do. These are the principalities and the powers, the forces of evil. Lord, in a lot of ways, they're dressed up in, in ways that seem good to us, that seem righteous to an extent. And yet we know that if we are not devoted to you and you alone, that we have taken the wrong path. Lord, we thank you for the example of Paul who was willing to sacrifice his very life for the integrity of the gospel, to be able to proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen again without any compromise, without watering it down at all. Lord, help us to be that bold in the power of your spirit to live wholly and totally for you. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All join me in standing as we sing You Are Salt for the Earth. You are salt for the earth, O oh people, salt for the kingdom of God. Share the flavor of life, O oh people, life in the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy. Justice, bring forth the city of God. You are a light on the hill, O oh people, light for the city of God. Shine so holy and bright, O oh people, shine for the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth the kingdom of peace, bring of justice bring forth the city of God you are a seed of the word O oh people bring forth the kingdom of God seeds of mercy and seeds of justice grow in the kingdom of God bring forth the kingdom of mercy bring forth the kingdom of peace Bring forth the kingdom of justice, bring forth the city of God. We are a blessed and a pilgrim people, bound for the kingdom of God. Love our journey and love our homeland, love is the kingdom of God. Bring forth the kingdom of mercy, bring forth kingdom of peace bring forth the kingdom of justice bring forth the city of God again I want to remind you come out 430 sing some more songs all the songs have all the good stuff in them so your chance to do that is this afternoon also uh, well that's enough let's let's pray <laughs> Lord we are grateful that you've gathered us together and given us an opportunity to worship you and we ask that you would Send us forth into the world so that we might be your willing servants, the instruments in your hand to bring about your will and your kingdom. We pray for those who can't be with us. Please bless them in a special way today. And Lord, 
We pray that you will bring us together to worship you again because you are worthy of our praise. All these things we pray in Christ's name, amen. You may go in peace.